the other day, I was reading from Dr. Martin Luther's Table Talk, and I ran across a conversation he had concerning what it is that Christians should be reading. He emphasized two writings outside of Scripture itself, always placing Scripture at the highest point. In fact, <laughs> at times Luther would say that he thought all of his writings should be burned so people would focus their attention on Scripture. But in this specific table talk, he said there's two things that every Christian needs to read. One being his commentary on Deuteronomy, of all things. And the second was Philip Melanchthon's Loci Communes. That's L-O-C-I-C-O-M-M-U-N-E-S. For all those that may be interested in purchasing themselves a copy of it, it is a, a very insightful read. I found myself highlighting, highlighting in this theological work almost uh, more things than what I left unhighlighted. What I wanted to read today was from Locus number 8 on grace and justification. And to piggyback a little bit on my last reading from Luther's writing on the New Testament, that is the Mass, I hope everybody that had heard that had seen Luther's emphasis on this seven letter letter little word called promise. I think most of us have misunderstood justification by faith alone because of our lack of emphasis in this word promise and how it is that our faith in the person and work of Christ to be associated with promise. Uh, and if we miss this aspect, I believe we leave our, our audiences uh, that here are preaching on justification by faith alone. We leave these audiences in torment uh, because this is such a necessary emphasis within the Christian's mind, one of which I could not understand for the life of me until I had understood Luther and his defense of Christ's little, literal words in communion. It's eluded me, uh, this association with the Christian and words of promise. So I read from Dr. Melanchthon's book today, who, by the way, for all of you who haven't heard that name before, was Luther's right-hand man in, in Wittenberg. He was one of Luther, if not Luther's best friends there, uh, and I'm sure the two had a wonderful, wonderful fellowship, and, and to receive Luther's endorsement, if there's two things you need, you read, one of them would be uh, Dr. Melanchthon's Loci Communes. That pretty much says that uh, he gave high value to that, that friendship. But if you can pick up in this reading today, uh, the emphasis in which the Reformers had on this idea of promise, uh, I will have accomplished my goal. Again, one in which I could not understand this relationship between faith and promise until I understood communion correctly. This reading is called Locus Number 8, and the title of the chapter is Grace and Justification. I'll just be reading a small portion. Hopefully it prompts you to get a copy of the book yourself and get your highlighter out and devour what's being said here. It'll be a conference. Some of the passages Different chapters in this book would be a confrontation from some, depending on what denomination you come from. But uh, it, in whole, will uh, greatly strengthen you and, and show you some of the beautiful facets uh, that may have uh, alluded you to this point in this central doctrine of justification by faith alone. So just a brief reading today from Philip Melanchthon. And Dr. Melanchthon writes, this locus contains the sum and substance of the gospel. It shows the benefits of Christ in the proper sense. It offers a firm comfort to pious minds. It teaches the true worship of God, true invocation, and especially distinguishes the church of God from other people, the Jews, 
the Mohammedans, and the Pelagians, that is, from all who imagine that man is righteous by the law, or by discipline, and who want us to be in doubt regarding the remission of our sins. There is a great dissension of opinions about this subject, for many follow human judgments and neglect the simple teaching of the prophets, Christ, and the apostles. They change this teaching into a philosophy, minimize the sin in our nature, and believe that only discipline is required by the law of God. From here they go on to imagine that there is no difference between the teachings of the philosophers and that of Christ. In all periods of history, these ungodly and human fabrications have obscured the true doctrine of the church. For example, the Pharisees believed that they were righteous by the law. Then, because it became necessary to ask why the Messiah was going to come, they dreamed up the idea that he was going to come to establish his rule over the world, not understanding that he had come become a sacrifice, sacrifice for the human race in order to satisfy the wrath of God against sin and that another kind of righteousness was going to be given to men, even before the Pharisees, hypocrites in the church in the period of the patriarchs, had believed the same things. But the prophets attacked these errors and cried that sin is not taken away, taken away by the righteousness of the law, that sin still remains in this mortal nature of ours, but that believers are righteous, their prayers are heard, and eternal life is given to them by God because of the promised Savior. Thus, when Christ and the apostles revived this teaching, immediately human opinions regarding discipline began to be spread abroad because it was something great to govern external morals. As a result, fanatical spirits arose who drastically changed the gospel into law, or Pharisaism, and imagined that people are righteous by the law. Lest Christ seems to have brought in nothing new, they said that he had handed down some new laws regarding celibacy and not taking revenge. These ridiculous notions were spawned immediately after the apostles. It is no wonder that darkness also followed. Although some godly people did retain the true understanding, yet there was a great difference among writers, with one speaking more accurately than another. But we shall speak elsewhere regarding these writers. At this point, I only want to say as a preface that the pious reader should understand that it is necessary to explain this locus of justification and with a grateful mind receive the blessing of God, which the light of the gospel has again restored. It cannot be denied that there were errors in the teachings of the monks, and although they have corrected some of them, their substance remains in regard to the remission of sins. They still vociferously assert that it is not correct to teach that remission of sins is received by faith, freely for the sake of Christ, and they do not admit that the term by faith means to trust in the mercy of God. Indeed, they want us always to be in doubt as to whether we are in grace. Then they add that we merit the remission of sins because of contrition and love. When they speak of contrition or sorrow or shame, which is without trust in God's mercy, the stronger it is, the more it drives a person to despair, as Paul says. The law works wrath. Then they say further that the regenerate which satisfy the law of God and are righteous because of their fulfillment of the law and that this very thing is a merit, and the reward is eternal life, and that in the regenerate there is no remaining disobedience and conflict with the law of God. They add that the regenerate still must be in doubt as to whether they are in grace, and they must remain in this doubt. This kind of doubt is plainly heathenish. Nor are these errors only minor matters, but rather they cast darkness over the gospel, hide the benefits of Christ, take away true comfort of conscience, and destroy true prayer. Therefore, it is necessary that the church be warned about these important matters. For this reason, I shall explain the sum of this matter as clearly and plainly as possible. First, in regard to discipline, we loudly proclaim that all human beings must be trained by discipline, that is, by that righteousness which even the unregenerate must and can produce. As Paul says, the law was laid down for the unrighteous. And God punishes the violation of discipline with temporal and eternal punishments. It is a great proclamation of discipline when Paul says the law is our schoolmaster unto Christ. Because the gospel is not effective in those who do not cease to go against conscience. Although no human activity is more beautiful than discipline, as Aristotle correctly says, righteousness is more lovely than the evening or morning star. Yet we must not accept the notion that it is the fulfillment of the law that it merits remission of sins, and that because of it, a person is righteous, that is, reconciled with God. Paul says that the Jews look upon the face of Moses under a veil, that is, 
not correctly, understanding the law of God, which is a voice condemning sin in man's nature and showing God's wrath against sin and arousing true terrors. When the gospel speaks of this understanding of the law and the knowledge of sin, many people who are puffed up with their own wisdom think that these are stoic exaggerations for which we need have no need. Since discipline in itself is a sufficiently difficult matter, they contend that nothing further is required and that this degree of diligence merits the remission of sins and his righteousness before God. Origen and the monks have badly distorted Paul in order to favor these human notions. Therefore, we must learn the true meaning of Paul from Paul himself and from the consensus of the rest of the prophetic and apostolic scripture and not from human opinions. Second, after we have given this caution regarding discipline, we must now return to the matter itself. The message of the church is the same. From the beginning, after it was received by Adam down to the end of time, the ministry of preaching repentance was instituted immediately in paradise, and the promise of the coming liberator was given, which our first parents understood they had received. This promise was gradually more fully revealed down to the preaching of Christ, who also himself performed this ministry to to the apostles he committed the same ministry, saying, Preach repentance and remission of sins in my name. Thus, in the church, the preaching of repentance must always sound forth as the voice of the law to which God condemns our sins, both outward and inward, which are that we do not fear, do not love God, do not trust in God. The voice of the gospel also is sounded, accusing the world because it does not listen to the Son of God. It is not moved by his suffering and resurrection, etc. Therefore, Christ says, The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, because they do not believe. John chapter 16, verses 8-9, through 9, and Romans 1, 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Thus Adam or David, upon hearing the voice of God, accusing, since his mind was not hard or stubborn, grew terrified and acknowledged that God was really angry against sin, and would punish sin. These terrors are often described in the Psalms. Indeed, just as the law declares this anger to the human race, so all calamities of mankind are in a sense the voice of the law, admonishing us regarding the wrath of God and calling all to repentance. Third, when the mind of man becomes terrified by this voice condemning sin, it hears the promise given in the gospel and determines that its sins are freely remitted for the sake of Christ through mercy, not because of contrition or love or any other works. In this way, when the mind raises itself up by faith, remission of sins and reconciliation are given. For if the judgment must be made that we will have remission of sins only when our contrition and love are sufficient, our mind will be driven to despair. Thus, in order that our mind might have certain and firm comfort, the blessing of God does not depend upon the condition of our worthiness but only on the mercy promised for the sake of Christ. And when God forgives sins, at the same time he gives us the Holy Spirit, who begins new powers in the godly, as it says in Galatians 3.22, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. These points are not complicated and are clearly understood by godly minds in the church. They are acquainted with spiritual exercises, anxieties, comforts, and prayer. Therefore, we must now bring forward some passages from Scripture. But the terminology must first be carefully explained. We have spoken previously regarding sin and the law, but now we shall speak of some other matters, such as the words justification, faith, and grace. Justification means the remission of sins, reconciliation, or the acceptance of a person unto eternal life. To the Hebrews, to justify is a forensic term, as if I were to say that the Roman people justified Scipio when he was accused by the tribunes. That is, they absolved him or pronounced him to be a righteous man. Therefore, Paul took the term justified from the usage of the Hebrew word to indicate remission of sins, reconciliation, or acceptance. All educated people understand that this is the thrust of the Hebrew expression, and examples are encountered frequently. Although we have said above, when God remits sin, he at the same time gives the Holy Spirit and begins new powers within us, yet the terrified mind first seeks the remission of sins and reconciliation. About this it is troubled. About this it struggles in true terrors. It makes no argument over which powers are infused, even if these accompany reconciliation. Yet we must never reach the conclusion that our worthiness or purity are the cause for the remission of our sins. For this reason, we must strongly stress the term freely.